Thanks, Megan. Thanks, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank Flagler College, first of all, for allowing us to use the room here. Uh, this marks the college's 50th anniversary, and I think it's just wonderful the preservation work they've done with the Ponce de Leon. I'd also like to thank Izzy, Stacy, and David for recording this. Uh, I'm sure they'll lose the tape as soon as this is over, but uh, it's really kind of cool for if you want to watch it again, you can't sleep one night, or somebody else is interested in it, the Society has its own YouTube channel. So we are slowly moving into the 21st century, and I'm glad to hear that. Uh, today's talk is based on part on a glass plate negative collection that we have at the library. Uh, a lot of these images were previously unknown, and uh, we were very lucky that the Crisp Ellert Foundation gave us a grant to go through all of our glass plate negatives to clean them, to catalog them, and digitize them, and we're slowly putting them up online with our catalog. So you're going to have a chance to see some photos that haven't been seen before, uh, but if you keep an eye on our online presence, you'll see a lot more photographs than you would have seen lately. Uh, it, it really helps uh, to illuminate an interesting part of St. Augustine's history. Uh, the Sunrise Rotary Club, I also want to thank, provided us with a grant to purchase a refrigerator to cold store and preserve the glass plate negatives, ensuring that they will be, be available for generations to come. One of the things you have to do with these old negatives is to keep them cool, because as you'll see on some of our photographs, they've already started to deteriorate. And if we don't take good care of them, we'll lose them. Uh, it's also important, since we've had them scanned, that we don't have to touch them. Because one false move and you're handed out with a jigsaw puzzle about 200 pieces of little slivers of glass. And that's just not a lot of fun to deal with. Uh, this fall, and for those of you who were here before and you saw some slides from the Richard, Richard Twine collection, that's another set of glass plate negatives that we had. Uh, but in a few weeks, the latest issue of the Ellis Scribano is going to be coming out. And that will highlight images from the Twine collection as well as from the Meyer collection. So I made sure not to, not to ruin it. So you're going to have to look at the magazine because you'll see all different photographs in there. Uh, and my one pitch is going to be that the St. Augustine Historical Society Research Library relies on volunteers. Uh, we're very lucky. We've got a large staff. Uh, but the better part is the fact that we could not do 100th of what we do without our volunteers. We have a core of about 25 volunteers, some of them are here tonight, and they do yeoman's work in helping us to get this material out so that the material is available for you, our public, and to preserve them. Because a lot of times people will say, well, you won't want this, it's not old. And I have to tell them, well, I'm not collecting it for today, I'm collecting it for the folks in 100 years who are going to be coming in here asking, what happened when? What did what look like? So, we try to collect as much as we can. My wife sort of has a phobia about me because she sees me grabbing uh, brochures and menus and stuff, and I'm throwing them in a collection to be filed. She just says, Bob, just do it when I'm not around, please. Uh, so tonight, we're talking about the Meyer family. They're St. Augustine photographers and tin can tourists. Now, one thing to remember now, these, these were not professional photographers. These were amateur photographers. So uh, you know, these aren't really super crisp, super clear photographs. But they are photographs of a time that we don't have a lot of records from. So uh, the Meyer collection of glass plate negatives, the ones we're going to be talking about tonight, were received in the 1960s and totaled over 600 glass plate negatives, boxes of engravings, and booklets. Uh, so it, and a good selection of that were all tin can tourists. That is the, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is. Uh, but these were photographs that were done in the 1920s and 1930s, very much tourist photographs. Uh, we kept, the society at that time kept those that were related to St. Augustine. The ones that were related to Florida were donated to the Florida Historical Society. They're down there in their library, Bendia Bays. I had a chance to go take a look at those. And those that were not in St. Augustine or in Florida, uh, supposedly they went up to the Camden County Historical Society, but they don't seem to know where they are. So one of my missions is to find out where there's about 200 glass plate negatives are. Uh, in the 1980s, Ken Barrett Jr., who was a professor here at Flagler, uh, 
worked part-time for the society in our photographic collection. And he took a lot of these photographs, scanned, uh, not scanned them, but he printed them. And so we have him to thank for preserving those, for preserving the twine photographs and some of our other material. Uh, much of what we know about the Meyer family is pretty much conjecture. Took a lot of photographs, took 700 photographs. Unfortunately, they didn't write a lot down. So as a result, we don't know a lot about them. So we've been, I've been taking a look through official records. I've been looking at some of the things that were written on the envelopes. Uh, but it's a lot of their lives is a mystery. In fact, uh, it's strange. You're going to see who the two photographers and some other folks are, but we don't know what Mrs. Myers, what Hugo's wife looked like. Evidently, they never took a picture of her. So as I said, we don't have too many portraits of members of the family, with the exception of Ernest. He was a picture hog. He took a lot of photographs of himself. Uh, from the earliest records we have, we believe that F. Hugo Myers, and that's the father, uh, was born in 1825 either in Prussia or Switzerland. Though on the 1930 census, Ernest, who I think was a kidder and probably would be a fun guy to have a beer or two with, claimed they were born in Scotland. Uh, they, they appear, good, I'm glad somebody got that one. Uh, it appears that they immigrated to the United States in 1866 and settled in Camden, Camden New Jersey. In the Camden City Directories, Hugo is referred to as a sh sh cobbler or shoemaker. Though a newspaper clipping we have relates, says that he was a noted lithographer. So I'm not sure if that is, you know, the family tended to exaggerate a little bit. Uh, but maybe that was his occupation before he emigrated. So let's get started. So, this is F.H. Myers, so we call, he went by the name Hugo, Humor Richtischer Guitar Club. And this is about 1890, when Hugo would have been about uh, up in his 70s. So I'm guessing that that's, that's him. Uh, for those of you who haven't figured out yet, that's a beer barrel. Uh, and that's why I was so much, that's why I was so much funny. So I, I think they were a, a fun group of people. And here's the other next shot. So we have uh, that does not look like a Coca-Cola to me, but there's a bar. There's, there's more beer there. They've got a few mugs. So they're having a good time. So I imagine these were a group of guys that would go out and, and uh, sing German songs or whatever and have a good day. So this is Ernest Meyer. Uh, over the years, he's been I've seen his name with E-R and E-A, so just for the sake of uh, continuity, I'm going with E-A. So he, here he was about 40 years of age. We think he was born in 1865, 1866, possibly before he emigrated, or maybe he was born just after. Uh, but he was a news type, newspaper topographer lived in Camden for most of his life, though he spent a lot of time here in St. Augustine. He was also an amateur photography photographer, and the majority of the images were during the period when he was a tin can tourist. So these are two of the other folks you're going to see quite frequently. This is Jenny, his sister. And I had to, I had to get this picture from a larger photograph that we had because they never took a portrait of Jenny. So here's Jenny. And this is Tom, or at least that's who I'm calling Tom. Uh, during the tin, a lot of the tin can photograph, tourist photographs, they have the black cat with them. Now, I will have to say either this cat is drugged or he was a very nice cat. <laughs> I had a black cat. And if I put a bow and glasses on it, I would have been in surgery for about two or three days. Uh, so he was pretty good. And then we have pictures where uh, Myers has a stuffed alligator, and he's trying to pretend that Tom is going to attack the alligator. Uh, but we don't know if they picked him up when he was here in Florida, when they were in Florida, whether he was a Camden kitty. Uh, I just decided to call him Tom. It just strikes me as a Tom. Whoops. OK. So. Uh, the Meyer family, Hugo, possibly his wife, Jenny, and Ernest, 
Uh, we're here in St. Augustine for a couple of years, twice. In the 18, they came in 1875, stayed for several years, and later in 1882, they returned again for several years. During these visits, they lived up in North City, and then later on out in Moultrie. And in fact, one of the uh, envelopes that we have shows a picture of a plot of ground. It says that's where our house was, but it has since burned down. Uh, they visited again in 1889. We have a newspaper clipping which says that they spent an, uh, time at the Cleveland House located on the northwest corner of St. George and Kuna. So they were here for three different periods of time. Now, Ernest never did anything quietly, so in 1875 they made quite a splash. Uh, you can tell these guys were Camden folks. They were right there on this Delaware River. Uh, they came to St. Augustine, decided to hop into a bateau, one of those flat bottom boats, and started rowing. Well, one thing you do is if the wind's blowing off the shore, heading out to sea, and the tide is going out, you don't get caught in the current. Uh, so they started going, and all of a sudden they were heading out to sea. A child raised an alarm, and a group of volunteers set out in the pilot boat. They rowed out, and they rescued Hugo and Ernest, and I imagine gave them a pretty good talking to. Uh, we're going to see later on that uh, Ernest did a lot of engravings of things that happened here in St. Augustine. So this is Christmas in 1875, and this is the Greasy Pole. Actually, well, okay, you got me. That's 1876. I apologize. Uh, but Christmas Day was celebrated here in St. Augustine at that period of time with races, with events. And one of the things they did was they raised the mast, greased it, and put a ham at the top of it. So if you wanted to get the ham, you had to climb it. So Ernest and a couple of his friends formed a human chain. Ernest was at top, climbed up to the top, grabbed the ham, and they spent the rest of Christmas Day wandering around, what are we going to do with the ham? Should we eat it? Should we take it home? Should we cut it up? So they finally sold it, grabbed the money, and had a good time. <laughs> so they were about, I think right about that time, it would have been in 10 or 11. And this is the Peabody School. For those of you who know where the, where the library is, right there in the corner of Avalis and Artillery Lane on the uh, west side. Right above that is right now is there's a series of restaurants and shops. Well, that was the Peabody School. This, uh, and here we have showing where Ernest went to school. He never mentioned Jenny going to school there, but presumably she did. So this was a so this is a, one of the few images we have of the Peabody School and also shows how it was arranged. Okay, so here's some of the images we have from 1875 through 1884. Uh, these images were probably taken by Hugo, the, though some of the later ones may have been taken by Ernest. We can identify Hugo on some, and by that I mean is we find, rep, we find notes here and there saying it was taken by Hugo or the date it, date it was taken. But they show St. Augustine before the massive changes that came out due to Henry Flagler coming to town. I mean, we're standing and we're sitting and standing right here, one of the biggest changes in town that happened. Uh, Hugo used a folding view camera and a tripod with a seven and three quarter by four and a half inch dry glass plates. So basically what you're talking about is half a sheet of paper about a quarter of an inch thick. So, you know, today, pull out your phone, you pull out your iPhone, you've got six, 700 photographs on there. In those days, you would have needed a trunk, couple of trunks just to carry that many photographs around. So this is a farm out in Moultrie. I guess you would call these folks crackers. Uh, in about a period of time, 1875. So this is an example of one of Hugo's photographs documenting one of the poor farm families that we have out there. So you can, whoops, wrong button. So you see it's pretty much log cabins. Uh, there's almost a log chimney, probably had some sort of mud and stuck holding it together, and there's the family. Uh, right now, Moultrie is just a 10-minute ride down the street. In those days, it was probably an all-day carriage ride. And one example of what happens to, the photo, to these glass plate negatives, as you can see here, the emulsion is starting to get dark. 
So using Photoshop, I can fix that up a little bit, make it a lot more visible. I want to show you what it looks like and what happens when we don't take care of these glass plate photos. So here's the Villa Zareta before it became a tourist, tourist attraction. This is when Franklin W. Smith was living in there. It's uh, built out of concrete, poured concrete, and that's where Henry got the idea for pour, using poured concrete here in Flagler. And, excuse me, Ponce de Leon. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so it shows it's a little worse for the wear, but that's the way St. Augustine was. I think somebody might say it was sort of a shabby, chic little town. Okay, so this is Bay Street. Now we know it's Avenida Menendez. It's just a, now it's a four-lane highway with turning lanes and a big uh, palm trees down the center, but here it's just a quiet little dirt trek. So... Where was the St. Augustine Historical Society before we bought the oldest house? We we're right here on the corner of Bay and Treasury. This is Dr. Vetter Collection. Dr. Vetter had uh, a museum of curiosities. His first building was over at the corner, right about where the Hamlin House was today, but that burned down in the 1885 fire. So he moved over here to a stone house uh, after he died in 1899, the Historical Society purchased the collection, and you find a little sign there that says St. Augustine uh, Institute of Science and History. And right behind it was the Sanchez House. Eventually, when we outgrew that house, we purchased that house as well. Now, Vetter had really bad luck in picking places to, to put his buildings up, because in 1914, this building burned. So... Uh, I guess the fire insurance people did not like, like him very much. But so once again, that gives you an idea what a sleepy little town this was. I mean, it's just a little dirt track. We have a nice walking path where people would promenade. We have the, but nary, nary a car in sight. Of course, there wouldn't be any cars and hardly even a horse. Though we do have evidence that a horse was there. <laughs> and here we are looking at St. George Street from Cathedral Place. Uh, now, this right here is a place called the Florida Club. They were a group of photographers. And uh, if you collect stereopticans or stereo views, you'll find a lot of them done by the, by the Florida Club. In fact, a lot of the Meyer photographs, both early and later, were turned into stereo views. And this is the, the cross that was over the, let's see, what is it? I don't want to get this wrong. Uh, is the Convent of the Sisters of Mercy, a uh, order that was here at the time. And here's another view down St. George Street, and you can just see the city gates back here in the distance. And this is Benet's grocery store, and this is why I like photographs like this, because now we see a woman standing up here on this suite. So if you're interested in uh, what people wore during a particular part of time, we have that image right here. This is the San Marco Hotel. This is where the parking garage and visitors information center was. So when Henry Flagler made his second trip here to St. Augustine and decided he was going to build his hotel, start his empire here, this is where he stayed. Uh, 100 plus rooms, three or 400 people they would take. They had dining rooms. They, there was a golf course out front. There was part of the golf course was on the Castillo de San Marcos property. And the next two photographs you're going to see were taken from the balcony that's right up here. So he was up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stories. So you got yourself a really nice view. This burned down in 1897. Uh, once Henry Flagler opened up the two hotels, bought the Casa Monica, sort of went downhill. In the New York Times, they say it was a suspicious fire. Nobody ever proved anything. Uh, the one thing about St. Augustine, Henry built this building, Alcazar, out of concrete. Franklin Smith built the Casa Monica out of concrete. The rest of the buildings in town were like this, pine. Florida pine is wonderful, could resist bugs, everything else, but you light it up, it will go up in flames very, very quickly. So this is what happened to this building in 1897. 
So here we are looking south. This is, and let me not make sure I don't get messed up, this is Orange Street right down here. This is Cordova Street. Has anybody been to Ann O'Malley's? Right here, there's the original building. Still the same building. This is the Florida House and that's the Magnolia, two old hotels that went up in the various fire, fires that took place downtown. And here's a picture of the Castillo. This was a shell road, made out of shell, heading out towards Jacksonville. You can see there was no bridge across. This is before 1895. And this is what today is uh, Davis Shores. If you wonder why Davis Shores floods so dang much, that's because it was a marsh. Uh, so that's why these photographs are so cool. And you take a look at that and you go, my God, there was nothing there. Uh, and in fact, right around this time, the only two things that you could go out there would be the lighthouse and the alligator farm. And we'll see something about those in just a minute. So this, we've got a few shots of Anastasia Island that are kind of neat. Uh, what would you do if you were one of the swells out here and you wanted to do something? Well, you get a couple boatmen, take you out to Anastasia Island, get you some oysters, and have an oyster roast. If you look real closely, I, it took me about five or six times looking at this photograph, but both of these guys, I think all three of them have oyster knives in their hand. So they'd roast the oysters, open them up, and eat them right there. Uh, I somehow don't think that's water. I think they're having a good time. Uh, but it's kind of funny to see, a, you know, gentleman's all dressed up in a tailcoat. He has his top hat on. This gentleman's all dressed up in a derby. Uh, and these two guys, you can tell, were just more sort of laborers. But you can see there was nothing there on, Saint I on the island at all. Kind of cool. And if you wanted to have a great time out, you take the ferry across and you get the horse cart to the island. So this was a, a little causeway that was built up. And you can see right here, there's little tracks that the <coughs> horse cart ran on. And there's just two little pieces of wood for the horse to walk on that. Uh, so evidently, Meyer was really good because he stood out in the mud to get this picture. And you can see he had a full cart. Uh, used to be that the original pens for the alligators were kept down here. And in fact, if we really want to bring the, the uh, Constitution Plaza back to one of its original views, we should have a pit there with, allig with alligators in it. At one time, we did. So that would teach the tourists. <laughs> Lose a few three-year-olds, we won't have to worry about them clogging the place up anymore. Uh, <clears throat> So thanks to someone who was at my talk before, she told me about the fact that they used to take the cows that were here on, Saint, on, 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 dry, on the mainland, swim across to Anastasia Island, and they would spend some time summering on the island. People didn't summer on the island, except for a few folks. So for anybody who's ever stepped in wondering about somebody who let the dog run loose and did not clean up after it, I don't think I'd want to be there after a herd of cows has been down by the waterfront. Uh, when I saw that, I was just looking at it going, cows? There they are. So, uh, young Mr. Myers Ernest, as I said, he was kind of an interesting fellow. And, uh, you know, if you watch a lot of the HGTV or some of the other ones you've got, that's always the guy, he's usually young, and he goes, oh man, this will make a great man cave, I'm gonna put up a big TV here, fridge there, couch there, I'm all set. Well, Myers had them all beat. He built his own playhouse in the back of his father's property. Two stories, nice brick building, and there he is standing very proud, uh, relaxing in his room. He had his own personal safe, uh, had his guns there. But this is one of the cameras that we think that he used. 
So once again, not a lightweight camera. Yeah. Here's this dark room of mystery. Uh, originally, glass plate negatives, you had to get them wet. You had to put them in a solution, run outside, take the picture, take them back inside, develop them right away. Well, they developed what was called the dry process, where just like with a, glass, with a regular film you would do, you would take the image, you'd put them back in a box, take them back home and develop them. So this was this dark room of mystery. So there was a little room, and that, that's where you would go in and unload the negatives, develop them. There you can see, I used to, when I was in college, I took a couple courses on, in photography, and we develop our own black and white film, and all of this material looks very similar to that. We have all the chemicals up here. You'd mix up your chemicals, develop your pictures, put them up to dry, and here he has all of his tools. Once again, there's another camera sitting right there. There's his guitar. Uh, and all of his books. So he, he had a quite a nice little man cave. Had radiator for heat. This is downstairs. This is what's really wild about this guy. Uh, here's a little one or two horsepower gas engine. And it ran with a belt. And you can see here the belt goes all the way up to the top. So there was a series of axles up here. And when you wanted to run your press or you wanted to run your SAR or whatever, start the engine them up, put the, put the belt onto a flywheel, and it would run it. So you didn't need electricity or anything. So he had quite an interesting setup. As you'll see, there's engraving tools, there's paper, and he has his press. Uh, he was quite self-contained. Tin can tourists. Well, once this First World War was over, people had more leisure time. We now had automobiles. Things like the Dixie Highway were being developed. People would become tourists. They'd come out, they'd take a look and see what's going on in the world. Uh, and they were called, tin, does anybody know why they were called tin can tourists? Well, supposedly, I think it might be the Tin Lizzie, which was the old Fords, but usually because once they left, there was a big pile of tin cans from all the food they were eating. So they called them tin canners. As you can see, it was quite a luxurious life. Uh, yeah, I, I, my wife took one look at that and said, don't you even think about it. This is, there's Myers, there's Jenny. There's this car, all covered up with canvas. Now, let's see. You get a nice 70 or 80 degree day in the fall and winter. Cover yourself with canvas, World War, II, World War I surplus canvas. Not my idea of a good time. <laughs> my father had a World War II tent that he would set up every once in a while, and we'd all run into it, and they'd go, nope, not doing it. Head back out again. It was hot, it was smelly, but hey, he didn't have to pay for a room. So this is up in West Augustine, just an open area. They'd set up. Uh, further south, there were much more developed ones. There were some that had bathrooms, showers, cooking facilities. But for the most part, these folks were really just roughing it. So here's, here's Ernest and Jenny. As you can guess, that's why Jenny came along. She was cooking. So at least he set up a little, oops, a, a little stovepipe so she wouldn't have a face full of smoke. So here he has, he's got a little fly up here so they can stay in the shade. They'd probably have a little table and they'd be able to eat. And here they are relaxing and there is Tom. Oops, where's, where's, oh, there we go. There's Tom. So that's cool. And for those of you who are interested, that's a 1927, I think it is Chevy. Uh, besides going out and using tin cans, well, they'd go out and forage for food. So here's Ernest collecting oysters. They might eat them raw, or they might have a bacon, or they might have an oyster stew. Now, just yesterday, I was up at uh, the Crab Club in Julington Creek having, oyster, having some hard shell crabs. And if I could have gotten my grubby little paws on those crabs that were that big, I would be a happy camper. 
They aren't that big, but here he has a whole box of them. He netted them himself, and they were probably yummy to eat. Now, one of the things that they did was make palmetto brushes. First time I saw these, I was going, what the heck are they doing? Well, right here, they have sort of like carding units that would take, and they would take the palmetto leaves and just scrape them against the nails and get themselves all the little fibers, stick them in wood, and make brushes out of them. Now, whether they sold these or whether they gave them, uh, you know, everybody's probably going, bring me a bunch of or oranges, and instead they get a palmetto brush. And here's another view. So there's the saw he was using to cut the, cut the palmetto. There's the wood hanging up. These are just concrete blocks that they were using. This is probably Mr. Spicegers' farm up in West Augustine. Uh, the Spicegers were good friends with him. Jenny's right there. Now, what I don't understand is Jenny was married. Now, the gentleman was 15 years older than she was. But every fall and winter time, she'd spend all winter here with, with uh, Ernest. Not sure what was going on there. And here they are in Anastasia Island. And this is the uh, quarry overseer's property. And one of the great things in the 1911, I think it was, the Historical Society was the one that put up the sign and put up the fence to protect that. So the society's been working since very early years. And this is, I'm guessing this is probably in the 30s. Jenny's looking a little older. He's not looking too much younger. And here's Jenny at the oldest house. Now, one thing that you can tell about a tourist photograph is Stick somebody from the party in front of a building, take a picture as far away as you can just to prove that you can do it. So here's Jenny at the oldest house. There she is at the Fountain of Youth. Here she is at the city gate. Well, that's not Jenny, uh, but there's a couple of the alligators at the farm for a touristy photograph. Uh, here's Jenny on a log. Here's Jenny hiding in the palmettos. <laughs> I, I, I really wonder what he had against poor Jenny. Did she like burn his breakfast or something? And here she is at the oldest schoolhouse. Uh, and there's more and more of these throughout the whole collection. And here they are, they're visiting friends out in Moultrie. These are friends they would have known back in the 1880s, some relatives and that. And we have about four or five shots of these, and they're making an oyster stew. At least the women were making the oyster stew. The guys were standing around. And probably adult beverages were involved. And here's Jenny at a turpentine camp. Unfortunately, she's holding those are kind of a funny spot. She has two very big pine cones. But what I like about this shot is the fact that she's at a turpentine camp. So if you're curious about how they've managed to collect the sap for turpentine, you see they have all of these sort of chevrons cut in, and they're collecting the sap that we boiled down for turpentine. And you can see that they have a number of other trees. So a lot of times we'll get these tourist photographs, and they'll give us some interesting information that we're usually not aware of. Uh, from about late 1800s to the mid, well, about 1920s or 1930s, uh, we had the Ponce Festival. So the fact that St. Augustine had festivals during various periods of time is not new. Anything to bring the tourists in. So this was a multi-day day event. Um, here we have, notice the ship is moving sp smartly without sails. Uh, there's everybody out there. There's a bunch of priests out front and altar boys. These are the soldiers. They're coming into a landing right about where the marina is right now. And here they are out at the field by the Castillo. You can see the Castillo back here in the distance. Most of these young men were from the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind. Uh, so one day they were Spanish, one day, the next day they would be British, the third day they would be Americans. Uh, I didn't, he didn't take any pictures of the Indians, but we do have pictures of the individuals who pretended to be Native Americans. They had red long underwear, a loincloth, and sort of a mop on their head. Uh, not very convincing, but best they could do. 
Uh, so here they are in their British uniforms. You can see those look like they just had jackets that they pasted felt to, to make them look. And this is the Palatka Marching Band. Uh, they marched straight through town, so it was a big gay event. They had floats. This is the Benevolent Protective Order of Elks. And there's the elk's head. There's some of the elk's women in there. Uh, so we had sort of our own version of the Rose Bowl Parade before they had the Rose Parade. Uh, we were sort of second couple lately, but they a number of really neat decorated cars. This I really love because he's taking a picture of the event, but he captured two other people with, photo with cameras taking photographs at the same time. As I told you, Myers also did drawings. He was a, had a multitude of things that he could do. So he engraved them and he created two different booklets. Uh, we like those booklets because they'll show photographs that we no longer have, that we no longer have the glass plates to. And they show us visions of town that you know, I haven't seen in a while. And what's better is he also would put people's names on there. He would tell when it was taken. Uh, so we have a good idea of the time and date where some of these things happened. So, if you were standing at Theo's, this is what it looked like in 1876. There was this little bridge. Now, one thing to remember is the San Sebastian has been changed so much over the last 120 years. Uh, see a little boat there. But here is the orange groves. So just about to where Riberia Street would have been, that's right about there, it was all orange groves. And this is the Knowlton uh, sawmill. There were several sawmills around Riberia Street. If you've ever wondered why right there at Brody's Liquor on Route 1, there's a little street called Depot Street. That's because it was the depot for the St. For the, for the Augustine and Tacoy Railroad. Rather than trying to come in through town, which you know was kind of through the by ship into the harbor, because before they cleaned up the harbor, before they made a straight run into it, it was very difficult to get in. Boats might be out on the bar for three or four days. People would take a steamboat down the St. John's River to Koi, hop onto this little train. As you can see, very luxurious, open air cars, no roof. Uh, and they would come on down into, into St. Augustine, there at the depot. So if you were standing at a rent to avenue looking across the street, that's what you would see. Uh, Henry Flagler took this when he came in, one or the, either the first or second time he came into town, and he hated it. I think it took him four hours. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why he bought the St. Augustine and Halifax Railroad, why he worked to uh, create the Florida East Coast Railroad, to make sure he, he was vertically integrated, got you down here, so the quicker you get you down here, the more you could spend your money. I wouldn't recommend this now standing in the middle of King Street near Markland, but this is what it looked like at the time. Dirt Street, very rutted. So you can only imagine what it must have looked like, what it must have been when it was raining. Deep mud. Uh, and here we had an arch of live oaks, just beautiful. He also did topography. So topographers will create letters. And so we have an entire notebook of multiple copies of these. So some of this, OK, F stands for fishing. I got that. Not sure exactly what the E stands for here. And maybe that just means farm. He also had a wicked sense of humor. So here's a bar waiting for a live one. You can just see, they're just waiting for it to come up with a couple of bucks in their pockets so they can bum a beer off of them. Uh, here we have Ernest Meyer, member of the Philadelphia Typographical Union Number no. 2. Very proud of that. Herman serves you right. A uh, little advertisement for a boxing match. There's another view, a little bit classier view. Uh, oops, sorry. <clears throat> I'm not quite sure our beer contains vitamin P. They serve <laughs> highballs. <laughs> yeah, I think I just got that. Sorry, I was a little dense on that one. Sorry about that. Uh, 
They serve high balls and low balls. And I like this, if you drive your old man to drink, drive him here. <laughs> and so these guys are all dressed up. They've got the little derbies on here. And he's mixing a pretty cool cocktail. Uh, this is the pelican. So let me read this. It says, a wise old bird is the pelican. Oops, let me see. I think I've got it down here. My eyes aren't that good anymore. A funny old bird is the pelican. His beak can hold more than his belican. Food for a week he can hold in his beak, but I don't know how the hell he can. <laughs> I thought this little bit of this limerick was done by Myers, but uh, we were talking it over, a lot of people said Ogden Nash, maybe somebody else. It actually turned out to be a gentleman by the name of Dixon Lanier Merritt. So he stole the lines illustrated with the pelican, E. A. Meyer. <clears throat> this is Aunt Minty's house. So if you are on the corner of Charlotte and St. Francis Street, you, we have our parking lots up there. This house, Aunt Minty, she was probably an African-American woman. Uh, one of the oldest coquina houses in St. Augustine, Florida, on the west side of Charlotte Street, about 75 feet north of St. Francis Street, occupied by Aunt Minty, a Negro cook in 1876, destroyed long ago, along with many other old buildings that were curiosities for tourists. So here we have a little bit of what it looked like inside. And he talks about how, uh, shows the kitchen, the coquina fireplace, the dirt floor, and that the roof rafters were just round saplings. I don't know where this was taken, but this is so cool. It's an organ grinder and his monkey. I especially like this woman's open mouth response. Wow, I didn't know monkeys could do that. Um, I was curious to know if his house and his playhouse still existed. So I looked on Google Street View, thank you very much Google, and unfortunately there's nothing left. Now the Delaware River is about three blocks that way. Uh, it's become a kind of a shabby industrial area right now. Now Meyer and Jenny stayed up in, in Camden until about 1948, when they moved down here. And this, I'm pretty sure, is where his house was on Clark Street. Uh, if you know where the Mariottis is on Route 1, right there by the creek, it's right behind that. Uh, but anyway, they came down here in 48. Myers died in 1949. He was cremated and his ashes were scattered near the Castillo de San Marcos. <clears throat> Jenny lived to the ripe old age of uh, not, yeah, now, about 80 some odd years old. She died in 1960. And when she died, the collection of all the Meyer photographs, drawings and other material came to us. And it's thanks to her generosity that we have these here today. So as I said, we have hundreds more of these if you were interested in seeing any more of them. Look out for the, floor, for the uh, El Escribano, and come on up to the historical side. We'll be glad to show you these and some of the other images from our photographs. Any questions? Come on, it's your chance to stump the bob. <laughs> OK, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we only have, we don't have any city directories for 1875, so I don't know. We think he rented a house probably up there. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very much, folks. Appreciate it. <laughs>